Okay, this is the second video about pole zero plots. And in this video, we're going to generalize what we discovered in the first video, that poles, um, we can plot them in the complex plane, and that when we do plot them in the complex plane, we uh, can determine a lot about the types of uh, signals that an inverse Laplace transform is going to be composed of. So to generalize this, let me draw, oh, that's a terrible imaginary axis. They're generally straight. So this is the real axis, and this is the imaginary axis. And in the previous video, we introduced the idea that the root of a denominator, so again, we've got a polynomial that looks like n of s over d of s, a root of the denominator polynomial tells us about what sorts of uh, things show up in the partial fraction expansion of this uh, uh, n of s over d of s, which in turn tells us what the time functions that we're going to get look like. And we discovered that if I have a pole here, this corresponds to a 1 over s term in the d of s. And that then, when I take the inverse Laplace transform of this thing, is a u of t. Okay, it's a unit step function. So a pole at the origin corresponds to a unit step function. Well, what does a pole over here with a negative real part um, correspond to? So this might be at some value minus a. It has, it's on the real axis, so it doesn't have a an imaginary part, and it's got a real part of minus a. Well, this corresponds to a term in a partial fraction expansion that looks like this, a constant over s plus a. We know that in the time domain, a constant over s plus a transforms to a decaying exponential. So it's e to the minus a t u of t, or again, this is t. Okay, so basically we have decaying exponentials if we're on the real axis to the left of the imaginary axis. So what would happen if we have something out here, say a, a pole at plus a? Well, we again know that this corresponds to k over s minus a, so that's the sort of thing that would show up in the partial fraction expansion. And k over s minus a corresponds to an e to the a t u. Oops, let's make that a little bigger so it doesn't look like it's in the exponent. u of t. And if I graph this as a function of time, it starts smaller and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, it grows exponentially. So, what we now know is if we have a pole on the real axis to the right of the imaginary axis, then that corresponds to a term in the partial fraction expansion and in the time domain representation that's going to be an increasing exponential. Okay. Those are generally not a good idea. Okay, in our previous video, we looked at something like this, where we had a pole that had, say, a negative real value, and one pole had a positive uh, imaginary value, and the other pole had the negative um, imaginary value, uh, the magnitude of the imaginary values is the same, it's just that the sign is different. So these poles both are at minus b, and they're symmetric about the real axis. They're both the same distance away from the real axis. It turns out that if your time functions you're working with are real valued, which in the real world all of them are, then any time you have a pole that has a complex value, say j omega, you're going to have another pole that has the same real value, but the 
opposite sign for omega. So these poles occur in complex conjugate pairs. And hopefully you remember from the last video that um, these uh, these complex conjugate pole pairs correspond to something that is exponentially decaying and wiggles with the frequency of omega. So it's either going to be a sine or a cosine or some combination of a sine and a cosine. But the idea is that poles out here with negative real values correspond to these decaying exponentials. Okay, so far so good, hopefully. Uh, let's tidy up a little bit. Get rid of our unit step function. Okay, um, what happens if I have two poles that have a zero real value and um, complex conjugate a complex conjugate pair, so their imaginary values are the same magnitude but opposite in sign. What sorts of signals do these give me? Well, if you'll remember from the Laplace transform tables, uh, this represents either a cosine or a sine without a decaying exponential. So these guys are going to wiggle around and the amplitude is always going to stay the same. Okay, that's what I have here. And I have one more possibility. Uh, let's see, we'll do this in purple. If I have a pole with a positive real value and then it shows up as a complex conjugate pair, there we'll tidy this up a bit before we start drawing on it. So the pole is out here with a positive real value and I've got a complex conjugate pole. These two poles are going to give me a time function where the amplitude increases exponentially and I've got something that wiggles like a sinusoid. Okay. So to summarize what happens here, the real part of a pole determines whether something uh, grows exponentially, which is the case if the real part is positive, stays constant, which is the case if the real part is zero, or decreases exponentially, like this, which is the case when the real part is negative. The imaginary part of a pole tells me whether there's any oscillation in, this, in the time signal. So poles with an imaginary part of zero, that is poles on the real axis, like this guy, uh, this guy, and this guy, they don't wiggle. They're just either increasing, decreasing exponentials or the unit step function. Poles that have values off of the imaginary axis, like these guys, or values off the real axis, so they have non-zero imaginary parts, these guys wiggle. They have sines or cosines. And the distance of the pole from the axis, that is the magnitude of the imaginary part, determines how fast they wiggle. The farther away they are from the real axis, or the larger the imaginary part, the faster they wiggle. So there you have it. There is a complete description of a pole, or of, a, of the different things that can happen if you're doing a pole zero plot. So as an example, if I look at the previous um, example that we did, where we had s plus 1 over s plus, or I'm sorry, 1 over s times s squared plus 4s plus 13, I have three poles here. I have a pole at 0, 
I have a pole at minus 2 plus j3 and minus 2 minus j3, so I've got a complex conjugate pair. And this term, this pole basically ends up giving us a term or a time function that is the unit step function. These two poles give me a decaying exponential. Okay, so you'll notice we've been talking only about poles so far. But you'll also notice I have in the numerator this term s plus 1, which means that this function goes to 0 at a value of minus 1. So to represent a 0, I use a 0. To represent poles, I use x's. Now, knowing that this thing goes to 0 at minus 1, uh, you might be asking yourself, so what sort of time waveform does this correspond to? And the answer is, it doesn't actually correspond to a time waveform. What the zeros do is they affect the magnitudes of the waveforms corresponding to the poles. So depending on where the zeros are, uh, it, if I have a zero here, I'd get a particular magnitude on my unit step function and a particular magnitude on my decaying exponential. If I have a zero out here, then I might have a different magnitude on the unit step function and a different magnitude on the decaying exponential. So zeros turn out, and it turns out to be quite difficult to figure out exactly how the zeros affect these magnitudes. So zeros in some sense aren't that useful, although uh, if you start studying control theory, uh, you discover that um, in certain feedback configurations, uh, you can move poles to zeros and zeros to poles, and you can, you can actually do all sorts of really interesting stuff with the, uh, with the transfer function of a system. And so zeros are important in that context. So uh, this basically finishes this video. Hopefully, at this point, you can now draw a pole zero plot for a given, um, a given ratio of polynomials. And you can interpret from the pole locations what sorts of time functions you're going to have in an inverse Laplace transform of the ratio of the polynomials. So with that, we will end this video.